Revelation chapter 1. I've been looking forward to beginning a series on the book of Revelation. And uh, put in a lot of time and want to make sure that uh, what I teach is true. And this is not the first time I've taught. This is about the uh, seventh or eighth time that I've taught through the book of Revelation, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And uh, it's a great book. It blesses your heart, but it's one that most people look at as a mystery. They uh, read the different shadows and types and pictures, and immediately they just say, I can't understand it. I talked with several people about it over the last couple weeks. I asked people, have you ever really studied the book of Revelation? And uh, I don't think one single person said that I feel comfortable with the book of Revelation. Now, I want, I want to say that uh, I'm not saying this in arrogance. I'm saying it in humility. Uh, but the blessings that come from studying this book are immense. And when you find the truth, the truth will set you free. For a long time, I struggled with what this book taught. When I was about 22 years old, I started pastoring, and right out of the gate, the church wanted me to teach the book of Revelation. I'd had it in college, you know, I'd had teachers uh, to teach me about it, and I'd read all kinds of books, so I got me a chart. I ordered a chart, and it was a Schofield chart. And it started out, and it had, you know, each chapter marked out, and this would happen, and that would happen. And so I got about halfway through, and one, old, one of the dear sisters, an older lady, said, uh, Pastor, she said, uh, I notice that you're teaching a lot from a chart, but you're not teaching a lot from the Bible. And it was just like somebody stuck a knife in my heart. And I thought, you know, she's exactly right. I'm allowing a chart to tell me what I believe rather than the Bible. So I, from that moment on, I began to just study the Bible. And uh, a lot of people don't agree on the book of Revelation. There's a lot of disagreements about it. But I hope that you will at least consider uh, what I'm going to say and the Holy Spirit will bless it to your heart. Now, the first thing we want to talk about, the Revelation, uh, you, your Bible might call it the apocalypse. Uh, the word apocalypse is the actual Greek word for revelation, and it means the unveiling. Unveiling. So that's what it's all about. It's the unveiling of Christ. It's not the covering up of Christ, but it is opening up Christ. The study uh, of this revelation and the purpose is the book of Revelation is the most beautiful and descriptive of all literature in this particular category. Where else do you find the Son of Man walking in the midst of the golden candlesticks in Revelation 1, 12 through 20, and then wearing a white robe dipped in blood and riding a white horse in heaven with the saints following behind him in Revelation 19, 11 through 16. We see the doom of Babylon and the joy of Jerusalem. There is great comfort and joy as we look into the future with the love of God and His wrath rolled into one. Now the main purpose of the book, as we mentioned, was in uncovering Christ was to comfort the churches facing punishment from the opposition of the great dragon or Satan 
and God sees their tears and their sufferings. Um, when you study this book, remember that it was written in the first century. We'll talk about the date here in a few moments, but it was written in the latter part of the first century, and it was written to the saints who were being persecuted, they were being threatened with death, there were even Christians being put to death when this was being written. John had been exiled to the island of Patmos, and there he wrote the Revelation. I want you to look in chapter 7 and see how that in the purpose of the book, God cares about the tears of his saints. In chapter 7 and verse 17, For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of water, waters, and shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. This is one of the purposes. They were living in a time when to be a Christian meant that you were an outcast of society. Remember that all of the apostles other than John died violent deaths. You were hated. You were hunted down. And John was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to bring encouragement. Then as you look over to chapter 21 of Revelation and verse number 4, you see, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Revelation 21, 4. And here we have two places. Chapter 7, verse 17. Chapter 21, verse 4. Where he tells us that the thrust of this book is to bring comfort to suffering and hurting saints. Their prayers are important against the battle they were facing. In chapter 8... Uh, we see that even their prayers were taken note of. You know your prayers are important to God. And here in chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, it says, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. You ever think about that? That God keeps your prayers and they're kept in a golden censer and they're poured out upon his throne as a reminder of their uniqueness and their holiness. And the smoke of the incense which come up with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's Hands, Their deaths are important to him. Their final victory is assured. In chapter 15 and verse 2, it tells us, And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over the, his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. They have victory. And the Lord wants us to know that he cares about his children. Their blood will be avenged. In chapter 19 and verse 2, For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. So we see that he cares for his children. He governs them because they are his flock. 
in chapter 5, verses 7 through 8, he calls them his flock. He says, And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. He's coming to rule the world and to sit with his bride at the marriage supper of the Lamb and to reign forever in a new heaven and a new earth forever and forever. You say, how do you know that? Well, if you turn to chapter 21 of Revelation and you read one verse, 21 verse 17 and he measured the wall thereof a hundred and forty and four cubits according to the measure of man that is of the angel and the building of the wall of it was of jasper and the city was of pure gold like unto clear glass and he goes on to describe this glorious place that he has prepared the Bible says he's gone to prepare a place for us and that when that place is finished, he's going to come and receive us unto himself, that where he is, there we may be also. We also see that he is present with us, walking in the midst of the golden candlesticks. Now for those of you who may not be familiar with Revelation, the first three chapters deal with what's called the seven churches of Asia Minor. These were churches that started in the first century. And chapters uh, 2 and 3 uh, are taken up with describing uh, the relationship those churches had with the Lord and how that He was walking in their midst and how that He cared about what they were doing. He's alive He's the first and the last. He's the beginning and the end. He has the keys of death, hell, and the grave. The theme of the book shows us that things are not as they seem. The dragon comes up out of the sea in chapter 11, and he seems to be uncontrollable. But then in one thrust of God's mighty hand, the dragon is slain and put down. Throughout the book of Revelation, Christ is pictured as the conquering victor. Now you could do a whole sermon on this alone. I spent a couple hours just reading through these verses of Scripture and they're absolutely astounding. Maybe you'll be able to read them a little bit later. In chapter 1, verse 18, chapter 2, verse 8, chapter 5, verse 9, chapter 6, verse 2, chapter 11, verse 15, chapter 12, 9 through 14, um, on and on it goes. Chapter 19, verse 6 through 20, 22 uh, verse 3 all of these verses show that Christ is victorious somebody said I have read the end of the book and I know who wins we know that Christ our Lord is victorious and that one day Christ will overcome all enemies and he will reign as king of kings and Lord of Lords. Down through the years, I've read most every commentary on the Revelation, and I have been acquainted with most every man that uh, I can think of who write, has written down his ideas about Revelation. Uh, one of the things that I made a quest to do after I got saved was to study the book of Revelation and not just read it, but study it and digest it. 
And when the church at East Corbin Baptist asked me to preach, I asked them for one year to study before I preached my first sermon. And so I spent the, the most of that year reading every book, reading the Revelation, digesting all the information and I'm sorry to say that at the end of that year and after preaching through it the first time, I was more confused than I was when I started. I've had a lot of people say that uh, it's very confusing. And even people that have been Christians for a long time, they'll study this book and they'll say, I just don't get it. Now if we're going to get it, we're going to have to apply ourselves. We're going to have to read we're going to have to study. We're going to have to pray. If you want God to open our hearts so that we can receive, we must seek Him with all of our heart. Down through the years, I've read these commentaries. I read one commentary that talked about Napoleon's wars, the wars in the Balkans, the European wars of 1914, 1918. They speak of Wilhelm, Hitler, Mussolini, and Stalin and Kissinger. These explanations are those like them must be dismissed. For what would this have to do with those persecuted Christians in John's day? Those who want to make these things out as if he's talking about this event right now miss the point. Because the book in its direct context was written for the first century so that those Christians could be comforted about the victories that God would bring to them in the future. Now I'm not saying that Revelation is not applicable for us today. It is. It speaks to us today just like any other book in the Bible. But when men start saying, oh, well, I know who the Antichrist is. It's Henry Kissinger, or it's this guy or that guy. And you've heard all the different ideas. We are going to preach about who is the Antichrist and what I believe the Bible teaches about the Antichrist. But that will be for a later date. What happened 2,000 years ago had nothing to do with those in the first century. The author of the book is the Apostle John. Now there are a lot of folks who say that John didn't even write it. I read several commentaries that say that there was another John who wrote it, but I'm going to give you some information to show you why I believe John the Apostle wrote it. John the Apostle, the Revelation, and the Gospel of John are two books that he wrote, right? There's no question that he wrote the Gospel of John. I believe he wrote the book of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And he wrote the book of Revelation. They do not clash in one single point. You read the Gospel of John. You read the Revelation. They do not clash. In theology, in any of their facts, they match perfectly. They both call Jesus the Lamb of God. Remember what John said in John 1, 29? He saw Jesus and he said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And as we're going to see here in just a little bit, do you know how many times the revelation calls Jesus the Lamb of God? 29 times. 29 times he is seen as the Lamb who comes and takes the scroll. And he is the only one worthy because he is as a Lamb that was slain. And he takes the book, he takes the scroll and opens it and they cry out, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, omnipotent reigneth. They call Jesus the Lamb of God. The epistle and the revelation called Jesus the Logos or the Logos. 
John chapter 1 and Revelation 19, 13 call him the Logos. I don't think that's an accident. I believe John wrote the Revelation. The gospel and revelation are pictures of Christ as the preexistent Redeemer. Both speak of salvation through the blood of the Lamb, and whosoever will is taught. In John 3.36, John points out that salvation is open to whosoever will. Let him come. And we see this in Revelation 7.9, and Revelation 22, 17. Let the bride says, Come, let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life. The early churches ascribed it to John. Now let me just add this. Justin Martyr, who lived around 140 A.D., he said... John the Apostle wrote the Revelation. Irenaeus in 180 A.D. said, John wrote the Revelation. Who was a disciple of John's disciple, Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp, and he said John wrote it. Clement of Alexandria, who lived around 200 A.D., said he wrote it. Tertullian in 220 said he wrote it. Origen said in 223 A.D. that he wrote it. And Hippolytus in 240 A.D. said John wrote it. The evidence is overwhelming. So I'm not going to spend any more time trying to beat that horse. I think you see what I believe and the evidence for it. Also, there is evidence that points to John because he was banished to the Isle of Patmos. And if you'll look with me in Revelation 1 and verse 9, I think this is the clincher. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Domitian was the ruler at that time and under Domitian's reign he had John exiled to the Isle of Patmos where he wrote the beautiful book. But the real author is God Almighty. John was just a human instrument because God Almighty inspired this great book. Because chapter 1 verse 1 says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it. If you underline in your Bible... And I would recommend you underline in your Bible and circle in your Bible. There's nothing unholy about writing in your Bible. In fact, it helps you. The word signified is an important word in understanding the revelation. He sent and signified it. In other words, Jesus Christ is going to give us the message through signs and symbols. Right off, he starts out with the seven golden candlesticks. And you'll say, well, what's that? Well, if you remember, in the temple and the tabernacle, they had the Manoah, which was a beautiful lampstand, and it had uh, these places where they could put the candles, and they would light them, and there were seven candles, and that represented the seven churches of Asia Minor. That's a type. It's a shadow. You see that? So right off he says that he's walking in the midst of his churches. That he loves them and he's going to be with them until the very end. Uh, now, with uh, the purpose 
the writer and the content that we've looked at, we're actually going to begin, I've got about six minutes or so, to do an overview or to start an overview of understanding the book. Uh, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. I've never been able to beat the Bible as the best commentary. There are seven sections. Listen to me. There are seven sections in the book of Revelation. It lays itself out in seven pictures. It's like this, if you'll use your imagination with me. You take one picture and put it here and it covers the whole wall. And then another picture and cover to Brother Fred. And then another picture to the Fugits. And then another picture over to Brandon. And then another picture up to Jessica. Then another one up to me. And then you fill it out with seven pictures. And as you turn, you see the seven pictures of what God is saying to us. Now, to get into this quickly, I want to give you the seven different pictures. First off, Christ is in the midst of the golden lampstands. You'll need to write these things down if you want to remember them because uh, even the sharpest of minds, these things will slip from you if you're not careful. From chapter 1 through chapter 3, verse 22, is Christ in the midst of the lampstand. The second vision is the vision of heaven and the seals. And it starts at chapter 4 and goes all the way through chapter 7. Chapter 4 through 7 is the vision of heaven and the seals that are to be opened. Vision 3 is the seven trumpets. They start in chapter 8 and they go through chapter 11. The seven trumpets. Number four, picture number four, is the persecuting of the dragon. Chapter 12 through 14. Remember the dragon comes out to destroy the woman and the man child. And the dragon does all in its power to kill the man-child. That man-child is Christ. And then we see the fifth picture in the uh, laying out of Revelation. We have the seven bowls. B-O-W-E-L-S. Chapter 15 and 16 the seven bowls picture number 6 is the fall of Babylon chapter 17 18 and 19 now as you come face to face with mystery Babylon you're going to have to make a decision who is God talking about what other institution on the face of the earth can fit the description other than the Roman Catholic Church that has been drunken with the blood of the saints? Fifty million were put to death in the dark ages alone because they would not call the Pope Holy Father nor would they sprinkle their children, 
nor would they call Mary the mother of God, and for that reason they were put to death by the millions. Millions. So number six, the fall of Babylon. Number seven is the great consummation. Number six was the fall of Babylon, chapter 17, 18, and 19. And number seven, the great consummation, the ending of all things, chapter 20 and 21. And chapter 22 is closing remarks of summaries. These seven pictures give us an understanding of what God is saying to us in this book. If you just pull out one verse and try to read it and understand it, you can't do it. You have to put it in context. You have to put it in context with the rest of the Word of God. And that's why this whole book is self-explanatory if we only lay it out so that we can see clearly what is being taught. Uh, we'll talk about some of the other arguments a little bit and uh, talk about some different ideas that people have in our next study. But we've laid the groundwork for the introduction of the book, the purpose of the book, the divisions of the book, and then next time we're going to delve into each different division. And so there will be seven sermons on these seven different uh, cycles or divisions as we see the Lord speaking to His people. The whole book is to show that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and raised from the dead to save us from our sins. And that we do not have to be afraid of what men may do to us. We have the victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Alpha, He's the Omega, He's the beginning and He's the end. He's the first and the last. He's the great I Am. He has the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And one day soon, you say, Pastor, when's He coming? He could come at any time. Could be tonight. Could be tomorrow. His coming is what we call imminent. There's nothing to keep him back from returning. And I think you'll see that as we study. May God give us hearts uh, to have an open mind to receive his truth. Father, bless your word, I pray. Speak to the hearts of your people. If there be someone lost, I pray you might save them. In Jesus' name I ask, amen.